Hi everyone, welcome to BBD Talks. So for this episode of BBD Talks, we're speaking to Vusmuzi Matebula. We are discussing buying property. So the sort of checklist that you need to have before you buy. Um, we're speaking about renovating property, um, maintenance of property. And then we had a few questions uh, when I put up the little uh, question box in the stories about um, is it a good time to buy now with interest rates so low? How to buy if you're, for example, a creative or an entrepreneur and you don't get a stable salary every single month or you can't predict your salary? Um, is it a buyer's market or a seller's market? How long do you think it's going to last? How to make good property investments? How to maintain your property? Um, if you're if, if you're um, buying, we answer so many questions. Um, it was so this conversation was so important for me because like even if you know something or you feel you understand something there's always a takeaway you always learn Fusi actually taught me so so much and um, i'm so grateful i'm definitely going to look at um uh, rental and um like owned property purchased property completely differently after this conversation and as well in future decisions when buying property this will be really really important as well so a bit on Vusi. Vusi is an investment banking lawyer and property investor with over 12 years experience specializing in leveraged finance and commercial property finance Ooh. so that was also really important in our discussion because yes he is a property investor but because of his banking knowledge he's able to just give share holistic knowledge and advice um, on buying property and maintaining and selling and i think uh, when we're having discussions around property we miss that a lot because people are usually coming from one angle and i really enjoyed the fact that he was coming from both so he also added in his bio which i mean you know you have to be relatable he's also an avid ultra distance runner who chairs performance reviews for his kids so um you know he's a quite a multi-talented uh, man and i really hope that uh you i really hope you enjoy this conversation that you find it worthwhile that if you're buying property looking to buy in future um selling renting out renting um property this conversation is for you in order to understand uh, the property market a bit better and also to understand your home a bit better which is really important um, decisions around the home are really important to me so this is what this conversation is for i hope you enjoy it next up bbd talks Vusi Matebula. let's go i mean yeah this is just to share information and also to help people understand a bit more about financing. You know, it's uh, buying a house is, is, is probably one of the largest purchases that most people are going to make. Mm. And into a long term financial transaction, you really need to understand, you know, how it works. You know, if you yeah. don't understand how it works, it's so easy for you to get yourself into so much trouble um, long term over things that you could have possibly avoided up front because you know as, as the saying goes it, it, you can't unscramble the egg of course so once, you know it's done and it's difficult to come back from a lot of instances that you that you could have avoided in terms of the purchase itself in in in, in, in the assets in terms of making the right decision um, on that and then obviously the financing that goes with it and the cost that is related to that i mean you're looking at what mortgages are generally for a period of 20 to 30 years that's more than half of your life um, paying, a, paying a mortgage if you're not able to pay it off um, quickly. So, you know, I think the idea is to try and, you know, share as much information as possible in a non-complex way so that people can consume the information and then hopefully be able to use uh, the information in, in, in sort of their day-to-day -day, um, going, goings on, if you will. Yeah. So what are your, some of your big mistakes? Because you have to have made them. I've made this, uh, oh goodness. The first big mistake was uh, biting off more than what I can chew mm. um, of a commercial transaction. Um, 
try to get involved in a commercial transaction um, simply because as a professional, that's part of the space that I work in. And I thought, well, I mean, there's money to be made here. There's an opportunity. This is something that I can do. You know, not understanding would see there are many loopholes or hurdles that clients go through before they bring a deal to you that you don't necessarily see. Yeah. And learning those things, burning yourself and losing a lot of money in the process and a lot of time because you spend a lot of time and energy and resources developing a, a, a project for it to be a viable project and only to find that you can't take it any further beyond a certain point um, for, for many reasons. Um, that was, you know, an expensive lesson, but on a more sort of, um, call it uh, uh, realistic type setting in terms of what we're dealing with now, um, the biggest uh, lesson that I've learned again was losing money on a construction um, that I had started. Um, I didn't know the right people. Um, I was excited to start and I wasn't hands on in terms of project managing, nor did I know what to look for um, in terms of managing a construction site. So I relied heavily on people and it cost in terms of just people getting not doing the work correctly and then it has to be redone that's money that comes from uh, from your pockets so that was a hectic uh, lesson lesson to learn you know um, and losing the kind of money that I did um, in, in, in making that mistake you know after that though you learn once bitten twice shy you learn yeah. and yeah. and yeah and, and you move on from that and, and those are just it's, it's, it's part of the school fees I guess that that some of us pay um, in, in getting into in getting into these spaces, no one no one tells you that you know this is what to expect. Um, sometimes you just don't even know who to speak to and where to start, and you find yourself learning extremely. Uh, you know, in my case, you know, an extremely expensive lesson. You yeah. know, but certainly never to be repeated again, no matter what. Yeah, I do think once you've made um, errors and really big errors, they really do change the trajectory of how you're going to move or operate going forward, especially in things like property, because oh, no, um, certainly. like one small mistake is a very big cost. Yeah, um, certainly. I mean, you could take certain things for granted. I mean, especially, you know, for me, one of the mistakes in this particular project was someone getting the foundations and the, um, you know, and the measurements of, of, of the foundations uh, incorrect. Mm. What that meant digging up foundations and having to sort of reform or redo the soil so that it's compacted good enough to start digging the foundations again because you don't want to start off on a shaky foundation you're going to have a structure that's going to collapse on you you know so so that was a very really costly exercise a very expensive exercise and you quickly learn with oh in project managing not only do i need to know and understand the money aspect but I need to know and understand the construction aspect, what goes into a foundation, why is it built in a certain way, why are things done in a certain way, to be able to translate what's on the drawings to what's in reality, you know, and to learn how to manage the people that work for you, because ultimately these people work for you, you employ them, and you gotta understand the dynamics of dealing um, with different people in different settings. You know, you're used to working in an office environment and dealing with people in an office environment, and then now you're on a construction site. Yeah. You're deep, completely different kettle of fish, and you, you need to learn how to move between those um, those those two hats so you can manage um, the situations properly and not find yourself in what can be a big hole on 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 construction sites or construction projects. I think people who aren't in the industry, who aren't in the construction industry, don't understand that the better your planning, right? So the better those first three stages of a construction project, the smoother every other thing will go so unfortunately we're such instant gratification type of people we want it. like i'm moving into my house in three months that's on you um developer you you finish it right and mm -hmm. i think um you know what i always say is anytime i've made major mistakes it is because i was being rushed right and mm -hmm. obviously there, there is a level of taking responsibility and saying don't rush me, I can't deliver. But when yeah. you are being rushed and you're forced to deliver and you know it's all hands on deck, I do think a lot of things slip through the cracks, especially mm -hmm. in construction projects. So it's very important, I think, as people that we take a step back and sort of just say, okay, 
what are the professionals saying? If the professionals are saying it's going to take nine months, it doesn't matter that I want to move in in three. You know, yeah. like, am I willing to lose how many ever million versus just waiting out and maybe renting for longer or living somewhere else for longer? And it's, it's such a tricky place to be because you understand both sides. You understand being in the business, but you also understand yeah. being a consumer, you know, being a yeah. buyer. No, I mean certainly. I speak about uh, I speak about that quite a lot um, in, in 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 sort of my blog, and I speak about it in um, <clears throat> sort of uh, various aspects. So from acquiring your property and then doing perhaps let's say renovation um, work around your property. You know, I speak about planning. Planning is important before you go buy a property. You need to understand the numbers. You need to understand what is happening. You need to understand the kind of property that you're looking for. And that goes with a lot of planning. You actually need to sit down and write out the things that you're looking for. You need to sit down and calculate and do the necessary calculations in terms of numbers. That's a part of your planning. You know, make sure that your credit score is right and all of those kind of things. And that's a part of the planning process. You know, how is it going to impact your commute to work? How is it going to impact you being able to drop off um, kids to school, are there any medical facilities um, nearby if you're someone who may need medical facilities, you know, in an emergency situation, you know, so that's, that, that's planning and that planning is, is, is quite involved and I, I tend to do that planning to the most granular of levels where if I'm purchasing a property, um, you know, whether it's for me or an, uh, as an investment property, I'll even do what I call um, dry runs, you know, I'll go to the property in the morning before I head out uh, to work at the time that I'd normally go to work and drive the route that I would normally take from that property to work to understand what the traffic flow is like and how long it takes me to go to work. If you ask a lot of people that buy houses, I can guarantee you 99.9% .9 of people that own a house have never done that. Yeah. You know, I'll even do in reversal where I will drive to that place in the afternoon at the time that I'd normally knock off work so I can understand the impact or how long it takes me to get from the office to that place, um, you know, uh, after work. Um, do the drop off dry run for the kids in the morning. I need to get my kids to school in the morning. It's important um, that I do that and I do that in an efficient time. So I'll do all of that so I can understand how that impacts um, sort, of, uh, sort of the place. So planning is extremely um, important, whether you're making an acquisition or you're making changes, you know, to your house. When you're making changes to your house, you've got to plan the changes. You, you can't just say, I want to take down that wall. I want to do this. I want to move that. You don't know if it's something that needs structure, that is, you know, structural support. You can't just remove it. Ah, Yo, your whole roof is hanging on that pillar. You take it out, the roof collapses. You know, and because you don't know what you're doing, maybe you can see things, you can envision things, but you're not a professional. Get a professional in. You know, the moment you start tearing down walls and those kind of things, bring in an architect. You know, you may need to bring in an engineer because the load bearing is such that you can't just put a normal, you know, cement or concrete lentil over it. You actually have to put in a steel reinforcing structure to, to sort of um, weigh properly or balance properly. Um, all the weights that's sitting on that particular structure. So, you know, plan how you want the renovation um, to go, um, the phases in which you ought to, to do it in so that, as you say, it's a lot smoother. You know, you, you can't be breaking down walls here and tiling, you know, and next door. And carpeting and, and, and. You know, it doesn't work like that, you know. So if you sit down and you actually plan, you break it into pieces and you have a program of how all of this is going to work. And because a lot of people haven't done this before, get a professional in, you know, who can help guide you in terms of how all of that is supposed to, to happen. Get a professional contractor in, you know, you can't DIY everything. I know people on TV are DIYing things. I'm not, I'm not a painter, you know. I'm still um, opposed to those um, TV shows. Because I swear, as soon as I watch a DIY um, TV show, somebody's mm. going to ask me why I can't do it that fast with that um, $300 budget. With, and I'm just like, it's TV. It's not, it's not real. Yes. It's not real. Yes. Yes. You know, it misleads a lot of people. And mm. because it's TV, it's, it's shot to dramatize kind of yeah. uh, situation. And they never show you what happens in the background, you know, when they, they switch the cameras off, there's actually 30, 40, 50 crew people 
come in and work on the place, you know, so their turnaround times are going to be much quicker than, you know, two or three people attempting to do the same, the same type of work, you know, and the complexities in doing certain things, if you understand environments, you understand that, you know, how they construct houses in the US, in the UK, as opposed to here is very different. Um, you would know that, well, it can't take the same time because I'm not breaking down drywalling when I'm breaking down a wall. Yeah, I'm breaking down bricks and cement, you know, yeah. which is a lot to do, you know. Um, so the, the, all of those things to consider. But if you haven't, like we say, if you haven't planned, you're just not going to know where to start and what to do. And that will have, you know, a, a follow through impact. You'll, it'll take longer to complete the project. And I can guarantee you it'll be far more expensive because you'll keep going back to fix things that you shouldn't have you know, sort of, or that you shouldn't have done or that you could have done previously. And just to make an example, um, a friend of mine remodeled uh, his, uh, his kitchen. The uh, kitchen looks absolutely fantastic. They didn't change the floor tiles. He wants to change the floor tiles. It means you need to take out your cabinetry in order for you to do your floor tiles. Had you spoken to someone who's been through this before, I would have said to him, mate, budget for the tiles, it's gonna be cheaper to do the tiles now even if you just do them around your kitchen area only, if you intend to do the house, the whole house, just do them around your kitchen area. Go spend the money on buying the tiles so that you've got consistent tiles across your house. Make sure you've got enough of the tiles, an extra box or two, you know, and then just redo your kitchen area, put in your cabinetry, and then when you're ready, proceed with the rest of the house. Because in the long run, that has actually cost you cheaper than now having to take out your cabinetry strip out your tiles, redo your tiles, and then put in your cabinetry again. And you may possibly even damage your cabinetry, meaning you need to redo parts of your cabinetry. So it's, it's just those simple little things that, you know, you wouldn't think of as a person who doesn't do this on a regular basis because you want to get done. I want to see, you know, I want to see the end product. You know, you're in such a hurry to see the end product and you don't understand, you know, some of the little details that come into things. You know, you're looking to change your bathroom, for instance. And I say to you, listen, if you're going to change your bathroom, strip down your walls and you don't understand why the walls need to be stripped down, you may find that your house has old, you know, steel pipes that actually need to be taken out because if you don't take them out, you're going to lay um, new tiles and the next thing you've got a wall that's leaking through your tiles and you're not understanding why. And when you then fix it, you find that it's old pipes that you should have taken out at that time. And now it's a whole lot more expensive exercise than it was in the beginning where it could have been done and done right from the onset you know and when you're planning to do such things if you get a professional involved and a proper professional not sometimes the guys that you pick up you know as you leave the hardware store it has its benefits but it has its cost because you know someone who really understands the job will say to you oh, well you're looking to read your bathroom consider x y and z you may not end up necessarily having to replace the pipes but at least strip out a section of the wall so you know what's going on with your pipes. And if you need to replace them, then we'll do that. If not, we continue with the job knowing that it's safe to do so and you won't have any sort of long-term issues that arise thereafter. Yeah, I also think to add to that is we need to develop a sense of honesty about the projects that we want to do. And I think that's, that's missing quite a bit because... I'm not sure in your friend's situation, but I know in a lot of situations that I've been in, you know, you know that um, your end goal is to retile. You know that you want new tiles or you want wooden flooring, but because you're scared of the charge that's going to come up now, you keep quiet about that. And then mm -hmm. these people that you've picked up from wherever just carry on working. And then at the end, you're like, oh, by the way, can you also just quote me for tiles? And then everybody on site is shocked. So I think even though we're scared or, or afraid of being charged, the least we can do is just say, listen, the end goal of this project is to retile or to get wooden flooring or to get carpets, to get new cabinetry. But for now, how much do I need to make this happen? And will it affect anything else? Yeah. And, and that's part of the process of getting someone who's been through that exercise or someone who's a professional um, involved. You know, you may have an idea of what you want to do, but if it's something that you haven't embarked on um, previously, you know, and, and have like in-depth experience, get someone to come and do a walk around. You know, you may not necessarily need to hire them to do the work, but get someone to do a walk around and say, listen, I'm, do, I'm thinking of doing this, 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 and that, or the other. 
and get their input on it, you know? And when you say be honest, I mean, that's, that's, that's quite a fair statement, you know? Do the exercise, which a lot of people don't want to do. Do the planning exercise. Go to, you know, your, your various tile stores and find out what it costs to tile a 20 square meter, you know, room, for instance. You know, the all-in cost, you know, so you understand, well, if I'm buying tiles for a 20 square meter room or space, I need so many tiles, I need this much grouting, these many spaces, etc. So it's going to cost me X amount of money. The labor component may be X amount of money. It allows you to then also plan your budget in terms of what you actually need to do all of these renovations. And when you, when, once you're sitting with all of these costs, it's a lot easier to then break it down into edible pieces, if you will. Because not everyone is going to be able to complete a renovation all in one go. You know, it's a very capital intensive or cost intensive exercise. And most people are not fortunate to have, you know, that kind of money to be able to do everything in one seamless go. You know, and there's nothing wrong with them saying, let me focus on this first, get this done, get it done correctly. You know, then let me then after that, you know, take a break, more, save up a bit more, and then get on to the next, you know, the next project and such and such until it's complete, because eventually it will get complete as long as, you know, what sometimes we don't understand as property owners is that you need to be patient with yourself and you need to be patient with the process because so often it takes away so much from you. You know, you want to redo your kitchen, it means you've got to save a bit more um, extra money, for instance, which means, you know, fewer nights out with friends, you know, fewer nights um, eating out and those kind of things. And sometimes you're not patient with those kind of things. Um, but you've got to understand that the long-term value in putting that money into your property is so much greater than, you know, the dinner out or the drinks out um, with, the, with the boys where you can easily spend a few thousand without noticing. You can just imagine if you had taken that money and said, you know what, might. Yeah. You know, because sometimes that's the problem. You, you can you know, stock up or save the money and then you use it. So go buy the things that you need, you know, and say, I'm going to be inconvenienced. This particular room in, in, in my apartment or the garage is not going to have enough space in my house. So I'll call my tiles into that garage until I'm ready to lay these tiles so that I don't find myself using the money you know, on other things. And then you just feel frustrated because you're just not getting to the project even though you want to do it, you know? So, so, so that's, you know, a, a, a thing to consider in terms of just maybe saying, let me buy all the materials, have them sit here. And then I'll figure out at some point when I get there, how we then start working on the project. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk uh, buying property. So mm. you have quite a diversified portfolio that you've invested in, be it, I'm a bedroom, homes, apartments, etc. right? And I really want to get into what should I as a consumer, in your opinion, look for in these different spaces when I am buying? So if I'm buying a residential home, am I um, testing the water pressure? Am I doing the dry run? Am I um, having a, a plumber come in to look at the pipes? What exactly should we look for in order to ascertain that this is actually a really good investment for what I'm trying to do or where I'm trying to live? Before you even get there, the first part is understanding your end user. Mm -hmm. um, you may find a, a house that is a good investment, but there's no, there's no end user except for you. So if you're looking to lease it out, if I'm buying a, call it a three bedroom house, for instance, in a suburb, who is my market and what is my market looking for? That's what you got. That really, that's what you first need to understand before you make any purchases. Who is my end user so that you can tailor the property that you're looking for, or you can tailor your search towards the end user. Um, and once you've figured out who your end user is, it's then finding the right location for the end user. Because if I'm looking to um, purchase a, a house that I'm going to use as a, as, as a student accommodation, for instance, it makes no sense for me to be beyond walking distance from the university because you're creating more headaches for yourself. Now you gotta figure out transport, et cetera. Students are generally broke um, in the larger scheme of things. They don't have enough money to be taking an Uber to school and back every day. Okay, they need to be within walking distance. 
And once they're in walking distance, that means I've got the right location. It's a safe sort of area to walk to, to school and, and from school. Um, what do they need? What kind of amenities are they looking for as students in the house? What works for them? You know, and once you've gotten over that, then you say, well, okay, now I've got a base. Now then you start looking at the things that you're talking about, you know, um, <clears throat> is 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 the roof done correctly have there been any extensions of the house and if there's been any extensions of the house have they been done legally in that there are plans that have been approved by the municipality you know what is the build quality of the overall place realistically what are you going to need to fix you know what things are you looking at in terms of uh security are you going to need to make any upgrades you know so that the place is safer you know those kind of things um, you're right you know looking at is the water functioning, you know, are the electricals done properly? And you may not be able to see that, so you're going to need to call in an electrician, you're going to need to call in a plumber, because even though people should be giving you certificates, people are not always honest in the things that they give you. You know, yep. I could call a friend of mine who's an electrician to come and sign off, you know, and you take the certificate and you think, ah, no, your window is fine. Meanwhile, the electricals are a mess. And when you try to now call me to say, listen, you got to fix the electricals. I can be as difficult as I want about it because you calling me is not going to do anything. You now have to institute legal action, which costs a lot of money as opposed to you just fixing the problem. So then you fix the problem, but now you're fixing a problem that you shouldn't be fixing in the first place, you know, um, simply because it's going to take you a lot of money and time to take me to court to try and get me to get things um, right the way they should have been in terms of the certificate that I gave you. So I think the first thing, you know, you should understand who is your end user. I think we skip that part. You know, because so, so many times people say to us, you know, whatever property you buy is an investment. That is a lie. You know, um, I, I, I understand the strand of people who say that, you know, because not all of the properties that we buy are going to be an investment. And you can lose, you know, I say to people, you can lose your shirt, your false teeth, because you've lost so much money going into something that, that is just not viable for the purpose which you intended. You know, so uh, you got to do firstly, like I say, understand who your end user is. The moment you understand who your end user is, the more the easier it is for you to sort of look at the things that an end user would want. And sometimes that can be difficult because you don't understand who your end user is. You know, but try and figure out who my end user is. So if you decide that my end user is a young professional, what are young professionals looking for? You know, ask your friends, ask people around, ask the people that work with you. You know, as a young professional, if you're looking to lease a place, what are you looking for? What do you want to see? You know, um, if you're looking at a family, a, a young startup family, you got to ask yourself, what is important to a young startup family? Then you understand your end user and what your end user is looking for and what makes things convenient for your end user, which is what will drive the first element of demand is that, this place is convenient. If I'm a young family, you know, Tanamana who needs to be going to preschool, are there good preschools in the area? And if I'm going to be staying, you know, beyond a certain time in the property, is there a primary school in the area that I can get my child into relatively easy and one that I can afford kind of a um, kind of a situation? So you need to understand all of those dynamics. Then once you've gone through the dynamics and you look at the place, then you start thinking, okay, what are the structural issues? You know, what are the things that I can live with? What are the things that I can change? Because you can literally change anything in a property. The one thing you can't change is the location. You know, once you, once you tie to the location, until someone falls for what you've fallen for, you're stuck. Um, you're stuck with it, literally. So understand the end user, get the location right. And then the other things, I can fix all of that. If there's yeah. something wrong and the location is right, you can fix the roof. Do you need to have an end user that surpasses you? So I'm buying myself an apartment. For me, I am the current end user. I'm happy with all the amenities in the space or around the, the space. But do I need to then say, okay, but I'm not always going to live here. Somebody else will live here after me and I'll sell. So do I need to think of that person or do I just, if I'm going to live there, am I just cutting it off at me? You don't matter in the process. If you intend being a property investor, what you like and what you think, zero. It means absolutely nothing. Your opinions, 
No. And this is what people find difficult to get around their heads, you know, and uh, if, you know, sharing, you know, um, one of the things that I did. So when I bought um, <clears throat> a townhouse uh, some time ago, uh, the intention had always been for the end user. And uh, by that stage, I had become uh, a parent and obviously the townhouse was not, um, the size uh, was not uh, conducive uh, for, for, for family as a lot of people um, I thought and everyone voiced their opinions in how I should be getting a bigger house, you know, with a bigger stand. And my budget at the time was literally, I mean, I, I, was, still, I was still very young. And so my budget was also what a budget of a young person would be. You know, my budget was no more than 650000 This is all that I could afford. Now, you start thinking at 650000 what size of a house are you going to get? And you know, where? You may, and where, you know? So, Going to be out in the far flanks, uh, number one, that would not work for me. And two, I had already understood in my mind that um, I wanted to build up a portfolio of properties. So I had to sort of say to myself, well, you're going to be inconvenienced for a year or two or whatever the situation is, if you're going to be following your plan of trying to buy as many properties, you know, in as many intervals as you can. So think about not what you need right now, because this doesn't work for you but this works for another person who is the ultimate end user because long-term you're looking at having a tenant here for a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. So does this work for a tenant as opposed to you? And therefore I've got a place that works for my future tenant as opposed to me. I didn't like the place. I, I, from day one, I knew when I walked in that I really don't like this place. This is not where I'd like to live, you know, when it's all said and done, but this place would work for a tenant or someone who needs it more than I do on a tenant basis. So if you really thinking, would say you want to start building a portfolio and you're going to move out of the place and lease it uh, to someone else in future, then you've got to do everything by design. So what you think, what you like, what makes you happy, it counts for a very small proportion. What counts the most is, does this work ultimately for an end user and, and we struggle with that. And I'd, I'd even take it a step further. Even if you're buying a place that you wanna call home, you know, you gotta think, so if I decide to move five or 10 years from now, how easy is it going to be for me to sell this place? You, you, you need to think about that because you may like this house, you know, it's a very nice house, but it's in the middle of nowhere and no one wants to buy it. And then, you know, when you wanna sell it a few years down the line now, you're struggling to find uh, someone who wants to purchase it because it just doesn't make sense. You liked it because you thought the lights were cute. Can't make a long-term investment decision because you think the lights are cute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I also want to add um, something to what we were previously discussing. And I think mm -hmm. it's important for people when they're buying property to look at what um, rights the property, the rights of use, that a property has as is. And I think whenever you're investing in property, you need to know what's allowable now. So if you don't apply for any other land, you, any other type of right for that space, what can you do you know, within that space? For example, I know in um, Soweto, you can do a double story, anything over that you need to apply for. So if you're investing in Soweto for students accommodation, is a double story enough? for you. If it's not, you know that you're going to have to apply in order to make it a triple story. And that is additional money. And we really miss out on a lot when we're doing financial planning when it comes to property. Another thing that I know for sure we miss out on that I've missed out on is thinking your levy that you pay monthly to the body corporate is inclusive of what you owe City of Joburg. And it's not, it does not cover your water and all of that. All it covers, I think, is garbage disposal. But um, you will yeah. get served with the city of Johannesburg bill that- Three months later. That will shock you. It will shock you. Yeah. So we need yeah. to look at what does the council want? What does city of Joburg want? Like we need to look at as many of the costs. And, just to go back to what you were saying, you're absolutely right. If you know somebody who's done it, ask them. They'll probably right. do it. 
No, I mean, certainly. I mean, on a day-to-day, -day, I interact with people who are struggling with something as simple as body corporate rules, mm -hmm. um, having a sectional title. So Umundu, you know, has not asked for the rules uh, prior to purchasing so that they can understand what is allowable in the rules. I mean, I uh, was speaking to someone who bought into a, a, a complex looking to use the place as a Airbnb. Oh. Only to find Airbnbs have been specifically excluded in the rules of that particular complex. And now you're stuck, you know, um, with this property and how you thought of the investment um, it is now completely undone you know and you can try and fight the body corporate but likelihood is that you're going to get out outvoted it's been voted into the rules um, and is that the people who live there who tend to form a majority will say no we don't want that kind of an inconvenience or to deal with that kind of a risk and now you really until you sell this you know if you want to keep it then you you know you're you're, you're stuck uh, sort of sort of with that long term so you, you you're right you you need to do the research and especially if you're going to be investing in a place you need to understand all the costs that are associated with the property um and you're right you know when it comes to levies people think the levies cover everything no the levies just cover you and the costs associated to that place you know, as owners you know the security like you say the cleaning of the gardens you know the you know moving off the rubbish within the the estate because the municipality charges you a separate charge on your rates uh, statement for them coming to pick up you know um, the, the garbage on garbage removal days so you've you got to understand and when you purchase i say to people when you purchase a sectional property i always say to people one ask for the accounts of the body corporate um, from the owner because they should have um, the accounts of the body corporate, the financials rather of the body corporate. Um, every year, the AGM, everyone receives them um, electronically and a hard copy if you attend the AGM. How do the Ask, accounts help you? So what are you looking for when you're looking at these accounts? And how well managed the estate, uh, and how well managed the estate is. You know, it needs to be in a good financial position because if it's not, you're buying into that mess. You, yeah. you become for that. I mean, I once bought into a, a, a complex where there was an outstanding bill to the city of Johannesburg for 2.8 million. And it was there in the financials and I saw it and I raised the question. So hold on a second. Kolodau city of Johannesburg with 2.8 million. What is why I'm calling to mass pile and in 2.8 million? This is a huge risk. And they were able to explain. So, no, 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 we've got an issue with the city of Johannesburg. We've put the money to uh, aside in order to pay the city once the issue is resolved. We are now locked in a dispute, you know, with the city kind of a situation. But once it's resolved, now Iman Ikona, the money that gets paid towards the levy each month is a portion that should be paid to the city that gets paid into an interest bearing account. You know, you get to see um, all of those things, but you also need to understand the financials, which a lot of people um, don't. You know, um, I say to people, ask the owner for the uh, levy statement so that you can have a real view and understanding of what is in the levy because the estate agent will tell you an estimate. And I, I think they pay around 2,000 rand a month only to find that people are paying 3,000 rand a month. Yeah, you've, you've budgeted 2,000 and only to find that that needs to come from, you know, somewhere. You know, ask them, has there been any form of a special levy that is proposed? Because that's an additional um, amount, you know. Have they been making the necessary contributions towards uh, the maintenance, uh, the maintenance plan? Because um, schemes need to put money towards a maintenance plan which has a rolling five-year period have they been making the necessary contributions to CSOC you know so it's all of those things but again if you don't ask someone to help you you're never going to know these things and when I say the agent or the developer is not necessarily going to help you it's not being mean but they are not here to help you make an investment decision they are here to sell you their product yeah. so they're going to move their product in the best way in which they can. They will tell you all of the things that sell the product. They won't tell you the downside. That's what every salesman does, you know? I'm not going to sell you a car and tell you the problem with the car. I'm tell you all the nice, fancy, trinket things about the car so if you're interested in buying it. So it's up to you to then do the necessary research on what actually, what does this mean? If I'm making this acquisition, what does this actually mean for me financially? And it, it will help you not, or it, it won't harm you to say, 
let me spend a bit of time with someone who's done this or a professional. And if, you know, a professional is charging you a fee, rather you pay that one-off fee that the person will be charging you to help you navigate through this than be stuck with a monthly bill for the, you know, the foreseeable future. Big thing, a lot of people buy into schemes that are not financially viable. Um, one of the reasons um, why uh, government uh, sets up uh, CSOC, in fact, um, the onboard dealing with uh, community schemes. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of schemes, one, are unviable, so government is trying to force you know, um, schemes to, to, to be viable, but also to help people in resolving disputes uh, within, uh, within, within, this, within the schemes uh, themselves, where, you know, there are disputes that can't be resolved between the persons, and you can go to CSOC uh, to, to arbitrate. But a lot of uh, schemes or complexes are, are, are certainly not, uh, not viable. And you can see that sometimes they're just driving into a particular place where you say, I here, the grass is not even looking green. What is happening here? You, know, yeah. you just see the like, paint is old. You know, then, then, then definitely be asking a lot of questions. Say, oh, when are you painting? Because at some point it's going to come back to bite you. There will be a special levy for that paint. You know, where you see things in disarray, things, maintenance upkeep, security is looking tardy. You got to know they're cutting down on costs. Why are they cutting down on costs? We find that a lot of owners are not paying, money is not being collected properly. So you got to find the scheme that is well managed. And the financials will tell you, you know, if owners are up to date with their payments or not, because that affects the running of, 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 of the whole scheme. If you're buying to, let's say, one day become an investor, or you're looking at the, the current property that you live in as a, perhaps a future investment, how can you speed up this 20 year bond thing? Like what are some of the things you can do to just own this property faster? Because obviously until you actually own it, it's a liability and it's, it's not an asset, right? Um, it's both. It's tricky. <laughs> it's, 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 it's an asset in the actual sense of the word. It's, mm -hmm. um, that that, that it's, a, it's, a, it's an asset and, and, and it's there it's for your benefit. Um, it's a liability in that it has costs associated to it. Yeah. And if you're looking to become an investor, it gets a lot trickier because paying it off may not necessarily be good to you, be, be good for you um, as far as taxes are concerned. And maybe the issue around taxes is a discussion for another day. But basically, the more money you make, the more tax you pay, right? Yeah. So the more money you make on your properties, the more tax you pay. So the best thing for you to do is to rather expand your portfolio. And by that way, you, you, you're buying an asset, it's incurring a liability, which is deductible, and you get to offset some of the, um, uh, so, so some of the tax, uh, tax costs that come with that. But in terms of speeding up the process of paying a bond, really, it's as simple as paying additional money every month. And the problem is that, um, like you said, we always want instant uh, gratification. Mm -hmm. So that additional that you put in every month, you're not seeing the immediate difference. You know, you're not seeing large drops in the amounts or in the payments that you are required to make. Uh, it's, it's incremental. It takes time and you will see it more in the years than you will see it in sort of um, the drop in the amount in, its, uh, in itself as such, because you, every little amount that you add on reduces the, the, the sort of capital amount, if you will. And by reducing the capital amount, you reduce the ultimate interest that you're going to be paying because the lesser the capital, obviously the lesser the amount that interest is being calculated on. So it's as, it's as simple as, um, you know, uh, um, and when I say simple, I say it's a bit flippant, um, but it's as simple as putting in any additional money that you can each and every month and being consistent you know, uh, with that. If you think as in the 500 things I use that and I'm going to use that, let me just put it into my bond account each month. And I think once, you know, you've done it uh, for a few months, you then just develop a habit that just keeps you going and say, yes, I'm going to put in this extra 500 and each year, maybe you increase it. Then definitely what you'll see over an extended period of time is that the period that it will take you to pay the bond will start to reduce ever so slightly. And I think that is maybe when then people get a bit more encouraged um, to, to sort of do it. Personally, on an investment property, I believe in using leverage. I believe in using debt. So I wouldn't completely pay it off. And I always use sort of the equity in previous properties 
um, to purchase other properties. It's just about using debt smartly. Um, and, and this can be very complex for a lot of people. So that's when you probably do need to get someone who understands finance and what leverage means and what using the equity in an existing property is to help you manage that and manage that appropriately. I can rest assured even your private banker has no cooking clue what we are talking about now. So it, it can get a bit complicated. Um, so get someone who understands the mathematics and who can help you in sort of navigating that. But I personally, up until you hit a certain, a certain age and depending on how much you're already making from other sources of income, you don't want to sort of uh, call it, um, that could be a better word, unnecessarily increase your, your, your tax burden. You know, um, so, because the more profit you make, the more money that gets added on to that you make and your tax bill keeps going higher. So you want to try and avoid that. You, you, you really ought to treat it as, 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 as a business. I say to people, you know, because you bought a property and it's in your name and you're leasing it out, you don't see it as a business, as a business. And would you want to pay the highest rate of tax in your business? No, you use all the expenses that are deductible in the course of operating your business to reduce the amounts that you show at the end of the day, um, you know, for your profits. You know, simple EBITDA calculation. But because it's a property, it's in your name. You don't think of it as a business, you know, mm. and you need a mindset shift that just because it's in your name, it does not mean it's not a business. It's a business. You're effectively a sole, a sole proprietor that is running a property business. So manage it as that. And I think the more people start thinking of it as a business rather than just a property that I have, the more you're going to be involved, the more you're going to want to pay attention, the more diligence you want to do in respect of the property and trying to understand the dynamics, not just of the property, but just the whole market itself as far as property is concerned. But yeah, treat it as a business as opposed to side holding energy in the every now and again. Yeah. I think that's, that's such an important thing to touch on because everything from your monthly gardening to calling in a plumber when you've had burst pipes, all of that counts towards your maintaining this property, you know? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good call. I think we do need to look at properties we own in our own names and that we live in as some sort of a business transaction, you know, to remove that emotion from it. Yeah. Yeah, no, certainly. Uh, and you've touched on something, you know, also that I speak of uh, quite a lot and, 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 and I mention it in my blogs, is remove the emotions from the process of buying uh, a property. You know, the moment you get emotional about it, um, and this happens quite a lot, I think, in, in, in most markets, but more so in the South African markets, the moment you put emotions in it, you blur everything. You know, whether you're a seller, whether you're a purchaser, remove the emotions from the property you know um try and take that out as much as possible always be willing to walk away um from a property at the end of the day it's a few bricks and cement hey? i agree with you partially yeah. but i do think when you're in let's say you live in a property right you need to be happy in your property right certainly okay certainly but your happiness follows Follows after you follows the through. good decision that you made that was devoid Correct. of emotion. Okay. okay. Correct. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Okay.